of uh, Bolkowski and Vaikutanatan, and then a variation of that construction uh, with Gentry, um, that uh, they're doing, uh, so, but I'll start by talking about the, the Vaikutanatan scheme and then move to the other one, to the variant. Um, what, this is an upcoming Fox paper. What they do is they do fully homomorphic encryption without squashing with the, when the security is based on either the learning with errors problem or a variant of that called ring LWE. Uh, the main striking point about their system is that they deviate from that uh, blueprint in that they do support multiplication, but there is no underlying ring structure. Well, it's not that there really isn't at all ring structure there, but it's not in the same way as, as it was uh, in the previous, uh, in the first part of this uh, tutorial. Uh, and then they have a host of new techniques and tricks that are, uh, can be used to do further improvements. Uh, so before I talk about their system, let's uh, talk a little bit about learning with errors. Learning with errors uh, in this uh, formulation is, is a problem that was introduced by Regev a couple of years ago. Uh, and the basic premise is that it's hard to solve linear equations with noise. Uh, there are several alternative equivalent formulations of this problem. The one that I'm going to work with uh, here, it's most convenient for me, is the following. Uh, you are given a matrix A and another vector B. The matrix A is sh short and wide. Uh, and the vector B is the wide thing. Um, and your goal is to decide whether, the, the matrix A is always random. Your goal is to decide whether the vector is also just a random vector independent of everything else, or whether it is close to the uh, row space of A. Uh, by close to the row space of A, I mean that we obtained it as some linear combination of the rows of A plus a little bit of error. Uh, there are several parameters here. There is n, which is the dimension. This is the number of rows in, uh, in this matrix. Uh, then there is the modulus q. So all of these equations are happening mod q. Then there is the noise magnitude parameter, which is at least, a, uh, at most, a polynomial fraction. Maybe we would need to work with even smaller noise. Um, and m is the number of columns. Uh, and so, again, we have a random matrix uh, in ZQ to the N by M, then another vector in ZQ to the M, and our goal is to decide whether B is a random vector or whether B was obtained as S times A plus E, where S is random uh, and E is short. E is chosen at random from some distribution such that with high probability E is short. Uh, so these are two well-defined probabilities. Our goal is to distinguish between them, and the premise that is that this is hard. Uh, Regev showed uh, when he introduced that uh, a quantum reduction, and then Peker later showed a, a classical reduction, uh, showing that for some range of these parameters, uh, you can prove that this problem is as hard as solving some lattice problems uh, in dimension n, but any lattice problem, worst case lattice problem. Uh, in dimension n, so we have reasons to believe that this problem is really hard. Uh, so for now, uh, we're just going to go on the premise that this is a hard problem uh, and see what we can do with it. it. But it was used already extensively in the last couple of years in crypto to do anything that you can imagine, public key encryption, circular secure, leakage resilient, and everything else. Uh, now uh, BV showed that you can also do homomorphic encryption with it. Uh, so let's start covering the BV construction slowly. I mean, there are going to be many steps, and at the end of the day, we're going to have a homomorphic encryption scheme, uh, but let's start slowly. Again, bit-by-bit -bit encryption, this plain text is a bit B. Uh, let's start by thinking about it as a symmetric encryption. The public key will show up at some point. Let's not worry about it now. Uh, the secret key is a vector S. Ciphertext is a vector C. Uh, these are vectors in ZQ to the power M. So this is the wide thing. Um, and are we going to have a simplifying? No, N. It's a mistake. It's, it's the length. It's not the width. It has to be ZQ to the N. Um, 
You know what? I'm not sure. I'm not sure anymore. Never mind. We'll see. Um, we're going to have a simplifying assumption that the first entry in S is 1. So S is of the form 1 concatenate with T. That would come uh, into play later. Um, and the decryption formula would be the inner product between the ciphertext and the secret key, reduced mod Q, reduced mod 2, where the reduction mod Q, as usual, is into the uh, symmetric interval between minus Q over 2 plus Q over 2. And the additional property that we're going, the additional variant that we're going to keep is that the inner product mod Q is a small number. Uh, in absolute value smaller than this noise magnitude, beta times Q. In other words, the secret key in this system is a vector S. Ciphertext in the system are closed to the space orthogonal to S. Uh, the plain text is encoded in the parity of the distance. Now, for distance here, we really mean uh, the inner product between C and S. So it's not really a distance. It's more like a syndrome. But I'm going to keep calling it a distance no matter what. Um, the first thing that I want to say about it is that this is really an instance of encryption from error correcting code. So the space orthogonal to S is a code, and this thing is close to the code, and you, enco uh, you, uh, you encode your plain text in the parity of the distance. So this really is an, uh, an instance of the encryption from error correcting codes. So you do get additive homomorphism essentially for free as long as things remain close to your code. Uh, but now the first question we ask ourselves is how do you mul multiply? These are vectors. I mean, multiplication of two vectors, how do you do that? Um, they're not ring elements. So it's not that we don't have uh, something to multiply uh, vectors. We can do things. Uh, so the thought of using uh, tensor product to multiply vectors had occurred to people uh, previously. And I'm going to run with it for a little bit to show you what the problems we are. Because people looked at it, so oh, there's an obvious problem, and then went to look at uh, the, the blueprint instead. Uh, so I'm going to run with this idea, uh, this idea. I'll show you what the problem is, and then we'll see what we do. So let's try to use tensor product, OK? We have two vectors. We want to compute. We want to multiply them homomorphically. I mean, each, inside each one of these vectors, there is a plain text bit. So let's use the outer product. The outer product, or tensor product, is just a matrix where the ij element of the matrix is the product of the ith entry in u times the jth entry in v modulo q. Uh, and I can claim that if you have the secret key, you can still decrypt that matrix. Why? Uh, because if you take this matrix and multiply it on the left by s and on the right by s transpose, uh, what you're going to get is equal to the inner product of u times s, of u and s times the inner product of v and s uh, mod q. Now, if these two things were small enough, then you don't get a wraparound, and therefore that equal equality actually holds over the integer, not just mod q. And then when you reduce it mod 2, what you're going to get is that this thing, mod q mod 2, is really the same as uh, the decryption of u times the decryption of v. So, so far, so good. We started from two ciphertexts. We multiply them in this weird format. And we got something that we can decrypt to the product. That's great. What if you want to multiply more than once? Um, yeah, well, are you going to multiply the matrices? It turns out that that does, actually doesn't work. Uh, here is something that does work. Think of this operation. Actually, I, I was told that there is a better pointer. Yeah. Think of this operation uh, as a mapping from S to the plain text. So this is a bilinear form in S, right? So in particular, it means that it's also uh, linear in the tensor product of S with itself. What that means is if you look at that thing, this is a matrix. Uh, there is a linear combination of the entries of that matrix uh, that gives you that. Uh, what is that linear combination? Well, it turns out that if you open 
both u times v and s times s, if you open them into vector, let's say just you know, spread them one row after the other, I'm not sure. There is, there is some arranging of the entries that you need to take care of, but uh, there is some arranging uh, of, the, of the entries that would work. Then the inner product between these two larger vectors would actually give you the same thing as uh, that. So we're going to denote by S star our extended secret key. This is what you get when you take uh, the tensor product of S with itself and then write it in a vector form, and similarly the extended secret key. Uh, and now all of a sudden we have another instance of the same crypto system. We have a vector for a secret key, a vector for a ciphertext, and the decryption uh, procedure is inner product mod Q mod 2. Excellent. Uh, moreover, that thing, the inner product, is exactly the same as that thing. So if your parameters are set correctly, uh, this thing is still quite small. If the original thing was smaller than beta time Q in absolute value, then now it's smaller than that thing squared which is still smaller than Q. Um, that's very nice. Uh, now we rep can repeat this process. So we can encrypt, we can multiply, we can arrange it, and then we can multiply again. Excellent. There is a problem, fairly acute one, actually. Uh, the dimension grow quite fast. So we started from an M vector, or an N vector, I forget which is which. Um, and now we multiply, so we get a matrix. So it's M squared, and next time it's M to the fourth, and next time it's M to the eighth. This thing grows quite fast. Uh, and in fact, if you want to keep this thing polynomial, then you can't do more than a constant number of multiplication. So that's a bummer. Um, and this, I think up to this point, uh, people got before, and that it was obvious that there's nothing, no way you can make this thing work. So, so the first really, really nice idea that uh, uh, Bukersky and Rekuntanathan had um, is the following. So what we have is an extended ciphertext C star. Uh, that is a valid cipher to respect to an extended secret key S star. And what we really want is a low dimension C prime that's a valid ciphertext with respect to some S prime that's also low dimension. Uh, so maybe it's the original S or maybe it's a different S, never mind that. We wanted to have low dimension. We can't afford to, and to uh, get such a high dimension so far, so fast. And the key idea was we can actually publish maybe an, an encryption of S star under S prime. And then use something maybe similar to bootstrapping in order to en enable the translation, right? We have an encryption under one key. We want to do an encryption under the other key. Let's encrypt the first key under the second key and then do something like bootstrapping. But we really would like to get something much, more, much, more, more, much, much faster uh, than a uh, full bootstrapping. Let's hope that we can get something like that. Uh, we want to, we have a, low, a high dimension C star, we want a low dimension C prime. Let's publish a matrix that would allow us to translate S star ciphertext into S prime ciphertext. And the dimensions of this matrix would be such that, uh, you know, the number of uh, col columns would be the, the size of S star, the number of rows would be the size of S prime, and when we multiply, we get something at the lower dimension. Let's see if we can do something like that. Here's, here's what we do. This is almost the construction. There's one piece that's going to come later. Uh, here is something that looks very much like our LWE matrix. We have a random matrix A and another vector B, which is an uh, which belongs to the, uh, which almost belongs to the uh, row space of A, right? It's a linear combination of the rows of A, except that it has a little bit more. What's the little bit more here? There's a little bit of noise, small and e short and even, and also our S star. This is how we sort of encrypt our S star under S prime. Uh, moreover, the actual combination of the uh, the actual combination of the uh, rows of A is exactly our secret key. So our secret key is of the form one concatenated with some um, secret vector, and this secret vector is 
um, the, the combination of the rows of A. Um, notice that if you take S prime and multiply it by M, what you get is that minus T times A here and plus T times A here cancel out, and you're left with just 2E plus S prime. So let's see what happens if we take our extended ciphertext and multiply it by M. So first of all, we're going to get, uh, we're going to get something of the correct dimensions. We're going to get something of dimension the same as S prime. Uh, and then mod Q, we have, well, the inner product is the same as multiply M times C star multiplied by S prime. And then if we take the parentheses uh, of these two, the left two, then we get the inner product between C star and 2E plus S, which is the inner product between C prime and S prime, uh, C star and S star. This is what we wanted. This is our decryption there, plus some error term. And that looks promising because the error term is even, so maybe if we, if we can reduce things mod two, uh, it will go away. Well, almost, except um, C star is not small and that number is not small. So there's no reason to think that you will not get a wraparound. So it's true that you get this, uh, but this, is, this equality holds mod Q. And once you reduce things mod Q, maybe the mod T will go away, unless you can ensure that this thing is small and you don't get a wraparound. Uh, and you can't. If only C star was short, then this was small, so we have this inequality over the integer, and we take it mod 2, you get what you want. It would be really nice, but it's not. So we need to fix it. We have a long vector, C star, and we want to represent it by a low L2 norm. It's very hard to go long and short in this talk, because we're talking about higher and lower dimension and things. So I'll try to be, as much as I can, I'll try to say L2, uh, small L2 norm. But usually when I say short vector, I mean L2 norm. I will really try hard not to refer to low dimension vectors as, as short. This is not what we mean. So short vectors are low L2 norm. And we have a, a, a vector with high L2 norm, and we want to represent it as a vector with low L2 norm. And here is one way of doing that. So here is a, a vector. It has L2 norm of about 90,000. It has entries of a couple of tens of thousands. Uh, and we can represent it, for example, by writing down the digits. So this is a vector of higher dimension, but much lower L2 norm. It does represent this uh, other vector in some way. And actually, well, later we're going to use binary rather than decimal because it works better. Um, and one thing that you need to note is that the, these vectors are linearly related to each other, right? I mean, you can take the entries of this vector and multiply them by the corresponding powers of two, and you're going to get your original vector. So these are linearly related in somehow. So with this in mind, let's see what we do. Um, we have our extended vector C star, and it has k entries, let's say. Uh, so C star i is the ith entry. And we're going to write down the binary representation of each of these entries. So we have now a sequence of bits, C i 0 through C i L, and C i star is just you know, the sum of them with the corresponding powers of 2, and the C i j's are bits. Let b j be the vector of the jth bits. So b0 is the vector of all the least significant bits, and b1 is the vector of all the one bits, etc. Um, so c star is just a linear combination of the b j's with the uh, appropriate powers of 2. And similarly, the inner product that we're interested in is just the inner product of the b j's with s with the, uh, these powers of 2. And now let's look at the following thing. Uh, so we have a redundant description, redundant uh, representation of our secret key, which is the secret key, the secret key times 2 up to the secret key times 2 to the L. This is a vector of dimension log q times larger than what we started from. And then we have the bit decomposition, but this is 4 times s mod q. Okay. Um, so this is a, a vector mod Q still. Uh, and then we have the bit decomposition of C, which is just the concatenation of all the BIs. And look what happens when we do inner product. 
Uh, you do inner product, you get s time b0 plus twice s time b1, etc. This is exactly that thing here, which is equal to what we wanted. So we took our large L2 norm vector C star, we represented uh, by a small but higher dimension, a short but higher dimension uh, vector C double star. Um, and we still have our extended, doubly extended now, secret key such that if we inner product them, we get what we need. Uh, and yeah, and C double star is short because it's a zero one uh, vector. Excellent, so this is what we're going to do now. Uh, instead of publishing this matrix that lets us translate S star to S prime, we're gonna publish a matrix that lets us um, translate S double star to S prime. So the dimension are, well, the number of rows is the small thing N, and the number of columns is the large thing, which is by now, I'm guessing, N squared times log Q or something. Uh, and now we're giving them expanded ciphertext and we want to make, to get a uh, low dimension ciphertext. So first we're gonna increase the dimension even farther, get the doubly expanded C double prime, double star, and then multiply the, by this translation matrix. Uh, okay, let's see what we have. The inner product that we want, C star, S star, is the same as the inner product of the doubly expanded versions. This is what I had in the slide previous time. Uh, also, the inner product, the new inner product, the prime thing, the low dimension things, uh, is the same as the inner product of the doubly expanded versions plus twice this error. But now, the inner product, the original inner product we know was small, therefore also this thing is small modulo Q because it's the same thing. Um, that thing, that error term that we have here is also small because C double star is a zero one vector. It has very small L2 norm. And E was chosen as a small error vector. So it also has a small a short, short vector. There also has a small L2 norm. Um, and so we multiply it by two, it's still rather small. Uh, so this whole thing is small modulo Q. So you don't get any wraparound. So therefore this equality holds over the integer. Therefore, when you take it mod two, this error term goes away, and you're left with uh, the inner product between C prime and S prime mod Q is the same as the, inner, the original inner product between the star version mod Q. It's not the same, it just has the same parity. It's the same mod two. Uh, this happens over the integer, and mod two, you get the, the decryption of the new thing under S prime is the same as the decryption of the old thing under S prime. So this is how you do dimension reduction. Do I have it on the next slide? No, not yet, so let me stop for a second uh, and take stock of what we have so far. We start with vectors that are ciphertext and vectors that are secret keys. Uh, decryption is essentially inner product mod Q mod two. We want to multiply two vectors. We take the tensor product uh, and open it to a vector, that's a vector but it has high dimension. We're gonna, multi, we're gonna make it even higher dimension by representing it by its bit decomposition. Uh, then we're gonna multiply it by this translation matrix, get back a vector of low dimension uh, with the property that decrypting the new vector under the new public key, S prime, uh, is the same as decryption the old vector under the old cipher. So we managed to do one multiplication step. We switched a key in the process. We started from S, then S star, then S double star, now we S prime. So we're working with respect to a different key now. But we still have a low dimension ciphertext that now encrypts the product of the two bits that we started from. That's what we want. Let's talk about security for a little bit, one slide. Uh, why is this secure? Why didn't I give too much information by publishing this uh, matrix? Um, and the idea is that under LW, you cannot distinguish this matrix from just a random matrix that has nothing to do with anything around there. Uh, that's almost true. It would have been true if we added an error E to the top 
uh, row of this matrix. In fact, we added twice an error e to that uh, matrix. So you need to prove something, but uh, when your modulus is odd, you can show easily that that doesn't matter. Here is the proof. Um, this is LWE. It says that given a, a random A, it's hard to distinguish R but from 2A plus E. Uh, then also twice that thing are indistinguishable, of course. But for odd modulus, uh, a random, take a random matrix and multiply by 2, or take just a random matrix, it's the same distribution. Uh, similarly for that, and also these distributions are the same. Um, so if... Uh, this thing, if this thing cannot be distinguished, then so these things cannot be distinguished either. Uh, and then when you add S prime to it, it still cannot be distinguished. Um, so our, our, our matrix has this random thing, and then um, that thing that has S uh, star in it, but it's masked by that other thing that looks random. Um, so that's... There is actually a proof here, even though I didn't read it all the way through. Um, with that, we already have the first part of the BV construction. This is a leveled, somewhat homomorphic encryption. Leveled means that we walk level by level because we need to change keys every level. Uh, and moreover, the public key size grows. So for every level that we want to evaluate, for every level of multiplications, we need to publish one of these translation matrices. So the size of our public key depends on the depth of the circuit that we want to evaluate. So we imagine a circuit that consists of addition gates, multiplication gates, addition gate, multiplication gates. Additions you can do just by adding things, but multiplication we need to publish these uh, translation matrices. So the size of our, our uh, public key depends on the depth of the, the number of multiplication layers in our circuit. Uh, so the, pub, the secret key, you just choose all of these random vectors. Uh, the first entry in each one of them is just one. The public key has all of these translation matrices. And now comes, uh, in, initially I said don't worry about the initial public key. So the public key that lets you encrypt actually has the same format, except it's a translation matrix from zero to the first secret key. Um, and then, you know, SI times the matrix MI is just twice, the, is just the 2i error vector plus uh, this previous level secret key that was hidden there. And S0 times M0 is just twice the, the error vector. Uh, if you want to encrypt, what you do is you just choose a random 0, 1 vector of, the, of dimension M, and you multiply it by M0, add your bit with many zeros on it. So this is an M vector. This is an N vector. This is an N vector. OK. So finally, it's resolved. The size of the, the, the ciphertext is N. Uh, this is an N vector. You add just your bit to the first entry of it. Uh, in order to decrypt a ciphertext at the ith level, then you just do inner product with the corresponding secret key, mod q, mod 2. Uh, why does decryption work? So let's see why it works for level 0 ciphertext. Uh, well, if you inner product the, the ciphertext with the secret key, what you get is uh, the secret key times m times r plus b. Um, and the reason it's plus b is because s begins with a 1. s begins with a 1, and this 1 is, is getting inner product with this b. Um, now, s0 times m0 is twice e, uh, twice e inner product with r uh, is a small number because r is a 0, 1 vector, and e0 was chosen as small. Uh, so you get a small. Uh, number so you don't all of this thing happens mod q but since there is no wraparound it's also true over the integer and therefore when you take it mod 2 you're left with your bit b so this is why decryption at the first level works and the reason decryption in the priv in the in the higher level works is all of the things we did before we show that the inner product mod q mod 2 remains the same so if it's if it works to, for decrypting uh, level 0 ciphertext then it would work for decrypting all of the others as well um, 
if you want to add ciphertext that belong to the same, uh, to the same uh, level, then you just add them. If you want to multiply ciphertext that belong to the same level, uh, then you compute the extended ciphertext C star by doing tensor product, open it to a vector, compute the doubly extended C double star, which is the bit decomposition, multiply by the appropriate MI, and you get a ciphertext with respect to the next level secret key. Why is it secure? Well, it's secure because under LWE, all of these MIs look just as if they were random matrices. This is essentially the proof that I had like last slide or two slides ago. Uh, and if they really were random matrices, then the ciphertext would give absolutely no information about the bits that are encrypted. This, you need to use the leftover hash lemma. I'm not going to show that. Uh, but it's a fairly standard argument by now. Um, so we have our somewhat homomorphic encryption. The public key size needs to grow, but that's okay. Uh, the other thing that grows is the noise. So all the time I said, well, you take this thing, you multiply the noise, it's still small. Yeah, it is small, but it is larger than what it was before. So roughly it doubles on uh, addition and gets squared on multiplication, and then you add this extra noise terms when you switch from one level to the next, so things keep growing. Uh, and since it, dub it roughly gets squared on multiplication, this, the absolute value of the noise, uh, then you can't do more than log levels. After more than log levels, this thing grows uh, beyond polynomial, and then it exceeds your uh, uh, Q. So what, what do you need to do if you want to evaluate deeper circuits? So one thing that you can do is to squash and bootstrap. This crypto system has the same general structure as all the previous somewhat homomorphic encryption in terms of how decryption looks. So you can squash the decryption circuit uh, just as you did with all the previous schemes. That's one way. You can chimeric thing the decryption uh, system just like you could with all the other previous systems. Or you can do something else. So for now, uh, after we realize that now we have a new somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme that built without underlying green structure, which is a marvel in itself, let's go to the, to the next marvel and see how you can uh, get it to a fully homomorphic encryption without actually doing um, any of this fun activities like squashing it. So. And the trick that makes it happen is uh, uh, trick that, something that really shouldn't have worked, uh, and it's called modulus switching. All of the things we did were over ZQ. Uh, the observation, again, in BV, was that you can actually switch to a different modulus and still be able to decrypt things and stuff. That shouldn't, really shouldn't work, I mean, but it does. Um, so we have our C and our S, and we want to convert them now to a C prime and an S prime, such that for some other modulus, P, which is smaller than our current modulus Q, uh, it would happen that the inner product of the new stuff, mod P, and the inner product of the old stuff, mod Q, uh, happens to have the same least significant bit. Okay? Uh, and you can, use, if you could do that, and I will show how to do that in, in, in a bit, uh, if you can do that, then this is one thing that you could have done with it. Uh, and this is what uh, the BV uh, construction was doing, actually. Uh, they used it with P, which was much smaller than Q. Um, and you do that in order to reduce the decryption complexity. So notice, this is decryption. You do that, and then you take the least significant bit. So the main operation that you need to do here is multiply two numbers mod P versus multiplying two numbers mod Q here. And if P is much smaller than uh, Q, then, you know, complexity of multiplying mod P would similarly be much smaller than multiplying mod Q. Uh, so the homomorphic properties of your scheme de would depend on Q, but the decryption complexity would depend on P. And if you make P sufficiently smaller than Q, then you get something that can evaluate its own decryption circuit and you're happy. Um, it uses, they uses the modulus switching and the key switching in a combined way. So 
you don't, you don't, but it, in order to get that, you need to publish, and again, one of these key switching matrices and, and do things and multiply with it, et cetera. Um, what I'm going to show now, on the other hand, is this. Uh, this is the, the work of uh, Berkowski, uh, Gentry, and Venkutanathan. Uh, they use it, again, with P smaller than Q, but not so much smaller, just a little bit of smaller, and show that when you do that, not only you get the decryption to still work, you actually get the noise, noise to be smaller. So all you do is you take this, uh, you turn it into that, and all of a sudden, not only decryption still works, but also your noise gets smaller. And actually, you do things, it's very, very simple. All you do is you take your ciphertext and you scale it down. And then you need to round it. Well, it's not integer anymore. You need to round it in an appropriate way, and, and that works. So here is why it works. Uh, this is the main lemma that makes it work. Um, we have P smaller than Q. Uh, both of them are odd. And we have our original C and S. Uh, and we have the premise that the inner product mod Q is smaller than Q over 2, but actually significantly smaller than Q over 2 by some additive factor that depends on the L1 norm of S. So notice, in order for that to hold, S must be a short vector. You cannot have this premise hold if S is long. So later on, we're going to have to worry about uh, how to make S a short vector. But for now, let's just assume that it is. Uh, so this thing has to be smaller than Q over 2 by a factor which is not only the L1 norm of, of S, it's actually scaled up version of the L1 norm of S, times Q over P. Um, so suppose we have those. And let C prime be the scaled down version of C, rounded. How am I going to round it? I'm going to round each entry separately, either up or down, so that C and C prime are, are going to be equivalent mod 2. So the first entry of C is odd, then I'm going to have to round the first entry of C prime, either up or down to make it an odd integer. So if you have that, then you get the following two properties. First of all, decryption still works. The inner product of C prime with your, you don't change your secret key at all, just the, the ciphertext now. The inner product of C prime modulo P and the inner product of the original C modulo Q are equivalent mod 2. They have, as integers, they have the same least significant bit. Again, mod is mapping into the symmetric interval. I'm just reminding everybody. And the second thing, not only that, but the size of your noise went down from uh, what it was before to what it was before times P over Q, plus some additive error that you have here. Okay, so not only we decryption still work, the size of our noise is scaled down roughly by a factor of P over uh, Q with some additive error. Uh, how do we prove that? Well, once you state this thing, maybe the proof is not so hard, but it's not so easy either. Um, so here's what we do. Uh, so C inner product S mod Q, what does that mean? This means the inner product over the integer minus some multiple of Q. And we know that this is between minus Q over 2 and plus Q over 2, but actually we know that it's in a smaller interval. We have this premise that it's small, much smaller than Q over 2 by this additional factor of the L1 norm scaled up. So let's take the blue part and just multiply it by uh, uh, P over Q. Okay? So we get P over Q times S times C inner product with S minus K times Q times P over Q, that's K times P. That's in the interval between minus p over 2 and plus p over 2, uh, and actually in a smaller interval. And now when you replace this scale down thing by its rounded, well, you didn't introduce that much of a noise, right? I mean, this is just uh, you inner product the error that you introduced by rounding with s, and you get something which is, can be at most the L, the L1 norm of s, and you're done. So what we showed here is that you take the inner product of the new c with the same s, over the integer, and then you subtract from it the same multiple of p as you did before with q, and you get something in the interval between minus p over 2 and plus p over 2, which means that this thing is the inner product mod p. That's the definition of what the inner product mod p is. You take away a product of p until you get into this interval between minus p over 2 and p over 2. And that actually already proves part two of the lemma, because our noise now is exactly the noise that was before, 
times p over q because you multiply this whole equation by p over q plus the error, of the error that you introduced. So that proves part two, and it, left, it, it remains to prove just part one. Uh, so we know that the original thing mod q was that inner product over the integer my kappa times p, and we know that the new thing mod p is the inner product over the integer minus kappa times the new p for the same kappa. P and Q are odd, and therefore K, kappa times P and kappa times Q are the same mod 2. Uh, C and C prime are equivalent mod 2 because this is how we define them, uh, and therefore their inner product with S is also equivalent mod 2. And therefore, uh, when you look at this integer, which is the inner product over the integer minus kappa times P, uh, it's the same mod 2 as the inner product of the old thing uh, over the integers minus kappa times Q, and this thing equal to uh, the old inner product mod Q. So that proves uh, part one. So let me repeat what we did before I move on. Uh, we showed that if you start from uh, a secret key and a, a ciphertext such that their inner product is sufficiently small and also the L1 norm of the secret key is sufficiently small, then all you need to do in order to switch modulus is just to scale down and round appropriately. And as a result, decryption would still work and your noise gets smaller. Uh, the only thing we need to solve now is how to make S small. So here is the easy way out. Um, if, we, if S is random in ZQ, then the L1 norm of S is not small and you aren't going to get anything. But luckily, two years ago, Applebaum et al. proved that LWE remains hard even if you choose your secret key as a small vector. In particular, you can choose the entries from the same as the error uh, to be as, as small as the, the, the ones from the error vectors. Um, and so we're just going to choose our secret keys this way, and that's how we make them small. So we didn't really need to do anything. Just choose your secret keys small, and you're, and you're fine. Uh, there is also a hard way to do the same. You're going to do this bit decomposition and powers of 2. That works as well, but it makes things a little more complicated. So I'm not going to show it. Uh, I felt obliged to, to bring at least one example here. So here's an example. Uh, so you do modulus switching. Uh, your original Q is 127, then the, the smaller one is 29. They're both odd. Uh, the ciphertext is this vector. The secret key is this short vector. And the inner product mod Q, you subtract 8 times the large modulus, and you get minus 30. Uh, you scale down, you get this rational uh, vector, and now you need to round. So the first entry in C is odd. Uh, so you need to round this one down to get 39 odd. Uh, the second entry is even. You need to round this one, well, also down to get 48. So the rounded version is 39 times 48. And when you do the inner product mod P, you see that indeed you subtract the same number of 29s as you did before with 175s. And the noise is indeed smaller. It was minus 30 before. It's minus 10 now. I mean, in absolute value, the noise got smaller. Uh, one point that I want to make, yes, it did got smaller in absolute value from 30 to 10, but if you look at it as relative to your modulus, it actually got increased because we had this added, uh, all we did is scale thing and we had this added uh, error. So it is smaller in absolute terms, but larger in, in relative terms. And it begs the question of what, why does that help you any? Uh, so here is what you do. You start with a very large modulus Q and a small noise, let's, say, let's call it eta. And after the first multiplication, the noise roughly gets squared. So you get noise which is roughly eta squared. And then you switch to a smaller modulus by a factor of eta. So the noise is similarly reduced to roughly eta. So you started with eta, you increase the noise, then you beat it down by doing modulus switching. And now you have noise of eta again, and you do it again. After the next layer, the uh, noise grows again to roughly eta square, and again, you reduce your modulus by a factor of eta, and the noise gets small again. And you keep doing that. So here is what you would get in terms of noise versus modulus with and without the modulus switching thing. So let's start with the without modulus switching. So you start, let's say, with a modulus of size eta to the fifth, just a number and noise eta, you do one level of multiplication. You're, we're talking about degree two polynomials now. Uh, the noise now is eta square. 
Uh, we do another level of multiplication. The noise gets squared again. Now the noise is eta to the power of four. The modulus is still eta, uh, eta to the power of five, so it's still much larger than the noise. But by the next level, uh, the noise now is too large. It's bigger than your modulus, so you get decryption error. On the other hand, if you do do the modulus switching, then you start the same way. You get a noise eta square, which you reduce back to eta by making the modulus smaller, so you get another eta, uh, and eta to the four. Next time, you're talking on degree four polynomials, your noise stays the same, the modulus gets smaller. Uh, degree eight polynomials, uh, the noise is eta, the modulus is eta square, and then the degree 16 polynomial, you finally reach to the point where you can't make it anymore. Maybe the noise is still smaller than eta, but the next time around, you're gonna get the decryption. But notice that here, things are nice and linear. You can do number of levels, which is essentially linear in the size of the modulus that you started from, and here they grow exponentially, so you can only do log. So it is, and using a modulus switching actually gives you an exponential increase in the number of levels that you can handle. Okay, let's put it all together. Um, if we wanna multiply things that are represented by vectors, we're gonna do tensor product. Uh, tensor product reduce, uh, increases the dimension, so we want to beat the dimension down, so we're gonna do uh, key switching or uh, relinearization re or uh, uh, re dimension reduction. I mean, this transformation has at least three names that I'm aware of. And you need to do the powers of two uh, versus beat uh, the composition encoding in order to make that step work. Uh, then you reduce the nodes by switching the modulus, and this works if the secret key S is short. And then you keep doing these three steps until the modulus becomes too short, too small, but at which point uh, you can't go any farther. So that, all of that gives you the uh, Rokersky, Gentry, Van Kuntanathan leveled fully homomorphic encryption, still leveled because you still need to publish this, secret, this public key one for every level of the of your circuit, but now you can handle circuits whose depth is any polynomial that you want. Uh, so you start by, you want to evaluate D-level circuits. Uh, the initial noise, which is something that uh, relates to your security, I'll talk about it in a slide or two, uh, is uh, eta. And you have this other parameter, which is slightly bigger than eta, which is the ratio between consecutive uh, moduli. Uh, so you Choose all of these moduli, Q0, Q1, up to QD, uh, where Q0 is the largest of them, and they get smaller and smaller by a factor of tau, I think. Um, so each one is, the QI is roughly tau to the power of D minus I plus one. The key generation is, again, you choose the short secret uh, keys, uh, the first entry is one, the other entries are chosen from the error distribution. Uh, for every SI, you compute the singly expanded SI prime and a doubly expanded SI double prime. Uh, all of that still modulo QI. Uh, and then the public key has all these transformation matrices from SI minus one to SI. This is a matrix in Z QI minus one. Uh, and the original matrix in ZQ0. Um, okay, the short error vector inside of each one of these guys is called EI, and it's a vector modulo QI minus one. Uh, and you have the same formulas that we had before. S0, M0 is twice the error, and SI, MI is twice the error plus the hidden secret key, except that this one holds mod Q0, and all of those, each one of those holds mod QI minus one. Uh, encryption, decryption, and homomorphic addition are the same thing as in the level thing, where the level i thing is, with a, is uh, all the operations are done mod qi. And then if you want to multiply two ciphertexts, then you do the tensor product, you get an n square uh, vector, uh, which still decrypts to the, which decrypts to the right thing, that is the product, uh, mod uh, qi. Uh, then you do the bit decomposition, you get a doubly expanded that still decrypts to the right thing under the doubly expand, expanded version of the secret key, still mod QI. 
Um, then you do the dimension reduction, you get something which decrypts to the correct key with respect to the next level up secret key, but still modulo QI, and then you do the dimension, re the modulus reduction, and you get something that's decrypted to the right thing under the new secret key, modulo, key, modulo the next modulus, QI plus one. And the noise in your, your final ciphertext is bounded by eta square plus whatever error terms you have divided by this ratio between the two moduli. And you set your parameters so that that thing is still smaller than eta, and this is how you choose, uh, you keep your noise from growing. Okay, what did we get? We got a leveled fully homomorphic encryption. The public key size is at least linear in the circuit. It's actually a little more than linear because the modul moduli keep growing, but no matter. Uh, you can handle circuits of any arbitrary polynomial length, and your security is based on LWE. But LWE is a, is, is, a, is a problem with parameters, so what parameters do we get? Well, the size between the largest modulus and the noise, the largest modulus is Q0, the noise is uh, this eta that we had before. This is rough, this is some polynomial to the power of the depth of the circuits that you want to evaluate. So if you want LWE with beta parameter, which is just a polynomial fraction, then you can't do anything more than a constant many levels. If you want to do more than that, uh, you need to assume that LWE is hard even when the noise uh, fraction is much smaller than that, in particular, uh, smaller than a polynomial fraction. Uh, the modulus gets smaller as we go up the circuit, so lower levels are somewhat more expensive than higher levels because you need to compute things modul uh, modulo a larger modulus. Um, some variance, some optimization, things that you can do. So first of all, once you reach the top level and you're with the smallest modulus and you cannot decrease your modulus anymore, what do you do if you want to keep computing? One thing that you can do is bootstrapping. Uh, you can bootstrap back into the largest modulus and do it again. Um, you will still need matrices going up. The, you need, for every level, you do need this dimension reduction matrix. So even if you do use bootstrapping, at least as per the first bullet, you need uh, translation matrices for the entire depth of your circuit. But you can start now from a smaller Q0 and reach the top level faster while you still have some levels to compute and then do bootstrapping to the largest modulus and keep going, it's possible. Uh, you can make it into a pure fully homomorphic encryption where you just have a fixed size uh, public key no matter how uh, deep the circuit you evaluate by assuming circular security. So at some point you go back to one of the keys that you used before and you assume that things remain secure uh, and then you don't need to, then you can reuse this translation matrices that you were using before. Um, you can base security on ring LWE. All of this thing was uh, vectors and things uh, over the integers. You can get the entries of these vectors to come from a different ring than the integers, for example, from polynomial rings. Uh, and that lets you use smaller dimensions since the polynomial ring itself, a single element there is represented as a vector, then uh, you can get away with dimension as small as two over the ring. So you have a vector, if you write it down as vector of integers, it's still a high dimension vector, but over the ring it's gonna be a low dimension, and that's actually good. It lets you compute things faster than it would if these were arbitrary vectors. Uh, you don't actually have to use Z2 as a plain text space. The modulus switching thing doesn't work as well when the uh, plain text space is not Z2, right? I mean, there was a point where we needed to round either up or down, and if that was because we needed C and C prime to be equivalent mod two, but if you want them to be equivalent mod seven, then you have seven layers and the, the error keeps growing. And if you wanted to compute things modulo some exponential thing, then you can't do that. Uh, so you need to use a different uh, trick to, uh, to, do, uh, to, use, to use larger moduli. Uh, it is possible though. Uh, another thing that you can do is batching. So far we had a single ciphertext per 
um, vector and it was very wasteful. I mean, we needed that for security, but it was very wasteful and you can actually do better. Uh, you can do Chinese remindering tricks in order to pack many, many bits into one vector ciphertext. And if you do that, then whenever you add or multiply two ciphertext, you would intrinsically add or multiply all the bits that are packed there um, um, correspondingly. So the first packed bit would be multiplied by the first packed bit, the second with the second, etc. And if you take all of these optimizations, all of them are described in the uh, uh, BGV paper on ePrint, and see how much you can reduce the overhead, then the overhead can asymptotically be reduced from what it was at least uh, lambda to the 3.5 before to something quasi-linear. So now for every multiplication, you need to do only roughly uh, security parameter number of operations or security parameter time polylog number of operations rather than security parameter to the 3.5. Um, Okay, where we are and where we want to be. So at this point, we have many new ideas on the table. In the last three months, there are a host of new things that we can do. Uh, and we're still in the phases of figuring out what works and what doesn't. Uh, moreover, given the rapid development on, of this, uh, it, would be, it would not be surprised if we have many uh, more new ideas soon. Uh, we'd actually be surprised quite surprising if we don't. Um, there are implementation effort implementing this scheme that I was talking about for the last hour and something. Uh, and the goal is to get usable fully homomorphic encryption. You want a construction where at least for some niche applications you can actually use it. Uh, and I'm actually quite uh, optimistic. I mean, my personal guess is that within two or three years, for certain applications, we will be able to use the schemes. Uh, real for real. Uh, of course, there are many open problems that remain. One that I'm going to mention is to base it on LWE with polynomially small uh, error rather than super polynomially small error. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Anybody wants to ask questions? When you talk about multi multiplying the plain text, this is multiplying to one bit numbers, yes. Okay, thank you for your attention.